Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm going to be joined by my co-host, Michael Hall, here any second. Happy Easter Sunday. It's Resurrection Day. Happy to be able to celebrate it with you guys. And speaking of, the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. And so we thought we'd bring in to the special episode our boy, Mr. Mike Callow from ESPN Radio. The title of this episode is The Funny Bone. Michael, and my question to you is with this Jaden Daniels Pro Day, Drake May's Pro Day, was there anything that you took away from those Pro Days? Um, Take away, I think, is a strong word. I think I changed my opinion on either one of the two. No, not really. Um, I thought it was definitely interesting that Drake May seemed to get a little bit of the jitters at the beginning of his, it seemed. Um, But as far as both of them go, I think it went swimmingly. Neither one seems to be injured, which is probably the most important part about this thing. Uh, Drafting the other number two, but takeaway is nothing too major. Uh, I think uh, if we if we do want to break down one thing, the uh, Jaden Daniels dap to uh, Peters, uh, the dap around the DMV is kind of like how I've uh, approached that one. That Mm -hmm. they seemed very friendly, and then of course you uh, you know you also had. uh, his name escaping uh, uh, Brian Kelly, you know, say, Oh, he's going to make a bunch of plays. And he said for Washington, uh, you know, do we read too much into that? I'm not sure, but overall I'm not, you know, too, uh, too keen on taking too much away from either one of them. Um, but they were both fine. There's nothing wrong with that, honestly, at this time of the year. Yeah. And I heard uh, somebody actually say that, that Brian Kelly interviewed the, the reporter asked the question with Washington included, and so that would kind Got of it. explain Brian Kelly's response there. But look, let's let people make you know mountains out of mohols. <laughs> it's okay. But speaking of, like, do you think that Washington is settling in on either Jaden Daniels or Drake May? Do you think it's purely between those two? Um, I think JJ's in the conversation, and okay. I I simply I literally just mean that. Like they have to at least mention him, right? Um, I am all about momentum at this time of the year, and Jaden is on that almost Joe Burrow-esque momentum where you take it from October until right now, he has done every little thing correct from that point on um, to his, you know, his play to the combine to how he's interviewed. Um, JJ seemingly is on a, you know, a even steeper momentum. It seems like where, you know, uh, you can call Harbaugh crazy, but he said, oh, this guy should be the best quarterback in the draft. Now, granted, maybe in another year he is, but we all kind of were like, dude, what are you, what are you talking about? And the scouts kind of back it up by going, eh, this guy actually is kind of legit. Maybe don't write it off. I think JJ has a very small percentage chance to be on this team's radar. Maybe if they trade down two or three spots, maybe he would be. But I think it is between May and Daniels. And honestly, I believe them when they say they are just starting to evaluate these two guys. Because let's be honest, they got a little under a month to really evaluate the two. And honestly, you know, you've heard the scouts talk that Jaden could be a number one pick in any other year. And May could also be a possible number one overall pick. That's a great position to be in at the end of the day. And I think they truly are weighing in on, on both of them to, to be the number two pick. I think it is between those two, though. Yeah, and uh, with my family today, we did an Easter egg hunt. My son and my daughter <laughs> got to be able to go do that. And now, we remember Easter egg hunting as kids, you know. And there were some Easter eggs you got. Like, sometimes you had money in it, right? And you'd be like, oh, yeah. All right, so that being right. said, let's say you went to Easter egg hunting for quarterbacks, <laughs> right? And you found that one Easter egg that had money in it. Which quarterback is that for you, Mike Callow, at number two? Uh, I will not go off this probably until the night of the draft. And for me, it's it's Jaden Daniels. Okay. Um, I, I think that it is worth paying attention to how this ownership group has approached things. And we have to re- I think we have to remind ourselves. And under a year, honestly. I mean, they, they got the team in, in the summer, and they've tried to make as many changes as they can. But I go back to how Josh Harris and especially Magic Johnson, they do not like losing. They do not lose quietly either. They are, you know, uh, boisterous when this team loses. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Um, Drake May, he's not – I wouldn't use the word project, but we know he's going to take a little bit of seasoning. He's going to take a little bit of time. Jaden doesn't seem like that's the case. At least he'll be able to use his legs to make plays – 
fast. Will he develop into a pocket passer? I think we all kind of know it's going to take some time for him, especially it's the NFL, right? Like mm-hmm. this, this takes time for these guys. But I think Jaden is the guy I circle because this ownership group wants to win fast and he can do that right now. And honestly, no one really has made this comparison, but I've said it on my show. I've said it with Bram, you know, right up the road is that guy, Lamar Jackson. And you know what I see around here where I live in Bethesda and closer to DC, I see Lamar Jackson jerseys on kids around here. And you know what? I think this ownership group looks at it as if we win, it'd be kind of exciting to win that way. Wouldn't it with a quarterback like that? I just keep leaning towards Daniels because I think the excitement and the way they could win around him excites the ownership group. And it kind of, it really does turn the page and set a tone um, that could be moved forward if they draft a number two overall. Yeah. With Jaden Daniels, the comp that came to mind for me was Trevor Lawrence. Um, I feel like they run very similarly. A lot of people forget about how, how uh, crucial Trevor Lawrence was in college on the ground with his legs. A lot of people, he couldn't be brought down. Some Jaden Daniels obviously is a better athlete in just the speed aspect, but I feel like their playing similarities are very similar. But let's say now you have Jaden Daniels, Mike, at left tackle. Do you feel comfortable with Cornelius Lucas, Trent Scott, and w- with left tackle? What do you think that they should do? Do you think that they need to trade back into the first round? Do you think that they should be uh, using that thirty pick six, 36 as the one to say we need a tackle there? What are you thinking? Uh, so I, I will say this. I'm not comfortable with the current options on the roster. Um, I'm I'm 100% into trading up back into the first round, depending how things shake out. Because you you honestly, you don't know. I mean, right. the, the, this this draft is deep at offensive line. And so you never know. They could fall into an option without trading up. I think they'll, of course, be paying attention to that second half of the first round of the draft. Uh, all in all, though, my gut says, there's too much ammo that they have in those first, what is it, 100 picks, I think, yep. um, that I think they trade back up, get a legitimate option at left tackle, and just go from there. They, it, It's funny. This team has really set themselves up that they don't have to do what Ron did and draft for need. They have right. starters at positions all across the board, and that I think they're comfortable with going into the season – really accept tackle and I would say corner as well when it comes to you know starters across the line but tackle is one that I think not only do they really need somebody they need somebody for the long haul I see them trading back up and you know maybe it'll cost them a second and a third or you know some kind of swap or whatever but they have the draft capital to do that I see them trading up to get that starting left tackle yeah and let's take this off the field just very briefly um I had a conversation with somebody I'm not going to say their name or you guys would have you guys would have no idea who they are <laughs> but the little birdie told me that there is a group inside of FedEx field going to work right now are, can you tell me about the renovations at FedEx field or do you expect it to be heavy Oh, all right. So we're re- we're really pivoting off the field here. Yeah. Um, yes, I do expect it to be heavy. Um, they're spending a legitimate amount of money, from what I know, and they they announced that too. I'm not yeah, breaking know. news I over know, here. Um, but uh, you know, as far as kind of like what we're gonna notice, I'm not sure. Okay. I know that they spent a lot of money um, that we didn't see um, over this past season, um, mainly just doing basic upgrades that weren't done under the previous regime. That's like the best plumbing? way I could describe it pretty much. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's one of them. Um, but that basically, you know, FedEx field didn't deteriorate on its own. Um, yeah. Well, uh, you know, it did, but you know, those fixes are easy if you just upkeep it. And apparently that wasn't done with the previous regime. And so will we notice it? I don't know, but I'll say this, like you go to games, I go to games. I'm, I'm a season ticket holder. It was much better last year in terms of getting in and out. And I mean that with traffic and, you know, with tickets and lines and stuff like that. And look, I kind of have faith in this ownership group. They're telling me they're spending a bunch of money on the stadium. I believe them. I don't think that that money's just going nowhere. And, and look, um, driving to and from games last year was like actually quite a bit easier for me. I mean, I'm only coming from Bethesda, so it's not crazy, you know, just hopping on the beltway. But um, I was kind of like, oh, wow, you're doing that you know, month three on the job. Let's see what you do next year. So I'm, I'm pretty excited that they're pumping all this money into the stadium uh, and we'll see what we can get. And for, as far as big upgrades, it's probably not going to be, you know, things in the lower or the upper level. I'm going to guess it's going to be club level suites, those types of things first, and then we'll see what happens from there on. Yeah, ever since I made the change to the red zone lot, uh, leaving has been <laughs> a complete difference. And I, I would advise all you guys to go there. I, you know, I'm 
trying to start my own little petition to change it to the burgundy zone lot. Um, so far, <laughs> it's falling on deaf ears, Mike. But I will bring this back on to the field. Um, Bobby Wagner's uh, Dan Quinn kind of talked about Bobby Wagner and brought really just highlighted the importance of Bobby Wagner to this football team. What do you expect out of the linebackers? Because obviously they added Frankie Louvu, who was a blitzing style type of linebacker. Jamin Davis, we know that he's more than capable of being that same exact thing. Do you expect them to do the, similar to what JDR and uh, Rivera did, only using two linebackers heavy, or do you expect more so of a defensive change in base defense? Uh, I, I agree. It's going to be mis- mainly two linebackers, but I think what happened here, and this was just another problem with kind of the Rivera JDR era was when you had first round picks like Jamin Davis, they felt the need to play those guys, no matter what. I mean, look at Forbes. Forbes was the same cut, right? Where they kind of forced him into a starting role, whether he was ready or not. I think what's going to happen. And I've heard this is that Jamin Davis is going to be kind of all over the place. Like I've heard he could even put his hand in the dirt and rush the passer because they need guys to, you know, step up in that realm, like seeing him on third down and then just being a straight up blitzer is not going to be shocking at all. So I think what happens here is they took the opposite approach of, you know, Rivera and JDR where it's kind of, you're kind of saying to Jamin, look, Wagner's got this, Luvu's got this, you know, you can just go rush the passer or do what we tell you on a play to play basis don't think as much. I think, I think there's one thing that we, we learned with Jamin. It was when he's not thinking that dude's a missile. I mean, that's the word Bram uses. He said it on the air and I I agree with it. He's a missile when he knows what he's doing. And as far as those other two guys, Wagner's an all pro. I mean, he's still an all pro. That's the craziest part with him, especially at this age. And, you know, you have a guy that wants to play for Quinn said it out loud that the only reason he's here is because he loves playing for that guy. There's nothing wrong with that. And as far as Lubu, kind of same same cut, right? Like short-term deal, he's going to have to prove it, but he also knows he's probably the second best linebacker on this team. So, yeah, I think the base defense is going to be two, but don't discount Jamin Davis to not make plays here. I, I think they're really setting himself up for success. I don't think they're going to pick up the fifth-year option on the guy, but they know that he's got a little bit of talent and that they could possibly use him to, you know, shore up the defensive end type rusher type guy on third down. Absolutely. And it's Easter Sunday. It's Resurrection Day. And our boy Hall is back from his little mini vacay slash late honeymoon that he did with his wife. How are you doing, brother? You got a question for Callow? Yeah, man. It's good to be back. Um, So it's kind of a two-part question, I guess. Do you think that wide receiver is a need for this team, knowing that they have Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson? And when I say a need for this team, I mean like a – top uh top 40 pick out of the first three picks they have do you think a top 40 pick is worthy of a wide receiver or knowing that adam peters just came from the san francisco 49ers there's been a trend in the nfl going back to i guess burrow and chase where a team likes to pair their receiver with their uh college quarterback and college receiver their teammates or whatever kind of you know where i'm getting at would you make that trade for brandon Ayuk, one of those uh one of those top 40 picks and give him a contract? Or do you think that wide receiver is even a need for this team at this moment right now? Draft Jaden Daniels and trade back for Brian Thomas. There you go. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say it's a need. I think it's a luxury. I think that's the word I'll use here uh, when it comes to wide receiver. Um, I don't see them trading for IU and handing him a contract. Um, I think, let's be honest here, the way this team has uh, started to build it's being built smart. They're not giving out a lot of term. They're not giving out a lot of money. They want to set themselves up for success for when they have to start paying or when they can really go for one of those guys in free agency. I think the best part about this regime is they're not fooling themselves. They know they're not contenders. They know they're not two players away. If they were on the cusp of a Super Bowl, I'd say, yes, let's go ahead and trade draft capital and hand IU that contract and worry about it at a later date. Right. But I just don't see it happening. I see them not, I see them taking a wide receiver in the draft, just not with one of those top picks. I think Terry is great as number one. I think Dotson has a lot to prove going into this year three. He was not utilized correctly last year. I think we all saw that. I think the whole entire offense wasn't utilized correctly last year for the most part, but I think they are not going to draft one with a high draft pick. I could see them maybe signing a vet. I don't know who that guy would be to be completely honest right now, but Need, no. Luxury, that's the word I would use. I I do think, too, you, you might relieve some of that pressure by taking a tight end with some of those top 
four or five picks too. And I could see them doing that and then maybe adding a wide receiver, you know, after the draft. My man. Now to wrap this up, Cal, I'll have only a couple more questions for you. But Hall asked you about the wide receivers, and we added one this week, an Alamade uh, Zacchaeus, um, who's 5'8", 198 pounds coming out. Latin. 2022 was his most productive year as a wide receiver, 40 receptions, 533 yards, and three touchdowns with Atlanta. Last season he was with Philly, so I think he goes back with Dan Quinn in Atlanta. Kind of talk to us a little bit about him because being at 5'8", we don't have a lot of tall targets on this team. Do you think this is more of like a depth piece, special teams kind of contributor? Definitely depth and and special teams. Don't discount him on kickoffs either, though. Um, this this whole new kickoff rule that got literally kicked off over the last week or so, I think threw some teams up for a loop here on how they actually operate. And I don't know how much of like the XFL kickoffs kickoffs you guys have watched, but these guys, it, it's it's almost like an offensive play. Um, if you watch these kickoffs, like the uh, the two opposing, uh, I don't know, I, I don't want to call them the lines, but two opposing, you know, uh, receiving and kicking teams, they line up pretty much five yards off of each other, have a collision, and they're all blocking each other. I could definitely see a shorter guy like that being a little bit of a gadget guy on kickoffs. I definitely just see him as a depth guy. I would even say um, I'm a Dan Quinn type guy. I would say a Brian Johnson type guy. Like they, they mm. he, that he is, he is on the offensive side of the ball. So don't discount that he could also just be one of the veterans in the room that kind of helps along the wide receivers, helps along anyone that needs to. But I don't look at him as a serious kind of number three type guy, but I think he could be a crafty kind of return guy um, or, you know, a number four uh, on the depth chart. Absolutely. And obviously there's been a lot of turnover on this football team this season with the new coaching staff, Callow. So I want to ask you about defensive tackle. Uh, we got guys like Fedarian Mathis, uh, who has yet to prove uh, that, that he uh, is the third defensive tackle on this roster. We also have Ridgeway as depth piece. Do you think that defensive tackle, because obviously Quinn and company, they know what they want, right? What, do you think that defensive tackle will be added through the draft this year? I think a late round pick isn't out of the question here. Um, I will say this though, you know, Federer and Mathis watch your back because they clearly don't care if you were drafted by the previous regime. They don't care how high you were picked. They don't care who you are. You are on watch essentially. And they, they've signed a few guys. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, we saw it. I mean, our guy, Cam Curl, you know, they, they didn't even really offer him a legitimate deal if at all, essentially. And he signed a pretty team friendly deal with LA. I just think this regime, they do not care where you were with the previous one. So I, I wouldn't even put Federin as a serious contender to even like make the team, honestly. Like it wouldn't shock me if they added their guy, you know, and it overtook him, right? I, I mean, and and that's just that's just unpacking Federian's career too, right? Like injury prone, hasn't shown a ton. Maybe he shows off in training camp. We see it all the time with guys that kind of figure it out, but Late round pick wouldn't shock me. It's obviously a luxury, though, to add another D tackle with having Allen and Payne. At least bare minimum, they seem to be satisfied with Payne and Allen. So we know we can pencil them in, you know, and they said Allen's not going to be traded, that they they calmed all that down. But I would say, like, fifth, sixth round, absolutely watch for a D tackle to be added here just for depth. And same thing, I wouldn't discount this team, though, to add a veteran on that second, third wave kind of vet minimum signing either. Yeah, man, it's such a depressing thought because, you know, we had hoped that something was actually being built here and for this new regime to come in and literally say, you know, X and that, that just, it's just embarrassing for me as somebody who, who was excited over the past couple of years, Calo. But to wrap this up, only, only a last question I have for you. Right now, Marcus Mariota is the only quarterback under contract for Washington. Uh, do you think it would be a smart idea to go down the realm of drafting two quarterbacks? And do you th is there a quarterback in the later rounds that, that has caught your eye that you would actually like as a long-term developmental option? Uh, I'm just going to do, uh, you know, just be pure homer here. I think Talia would be a good ad late round pick. Okay. I mean, he's, he would be that if they draft Jaden, I think that would be a similar type guy. Um, they will add one. I mean, Peters did say one of the few things he said out loud is that he wants to take four quarterbacks in the camp, which isn't the craziest thing in the world, by the no. way. I saw a lot of people kind of freaking out about that. They're going to add one more. They already have Fromm and Mariota. A late round pick seems oh, to be ideal. Fromm. My bad. Yeah. No, 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 I mean, I mean, he's on the roster. Like, I don't know how serious <laughs> he is, but like, you know, he's on the roster. And so they would add one more. I'm with you, like probably late round pick, maybe an undrafted free agent if they like a guy. But let's be honest, if we get down to that guy in the season, things are going really sideways. <laughs> we're, we're kind of hopeless at that point. But 
uh, you know, I'm a homer, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw Talia's name out there because uh, he's a turf, and honestly, he's a fifth year. What he was a fifth year senior this year, right? I think so. I mean, older guy, probably a little bit more mature, knows that he's kind of got to earn his spot on a roster as well. Yeah, we uh, we worked in the co- head coach's office actually at UMD, and that view of the outdoor field that he has, Coach Locks, and then the indoor uh, stadium <laughs> being there, right? Dude, that was a beautiful sight. You know how how hard it was for me not to take pictures and upload it as much as I wanted to, Mike. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining us on this Easter Sunday and giving us some of your Easter eggs at yourself, sir. Before we get out of here, we'd like to plug your show and your social media handle, just in case anybody watching hasn't followed you yet, brother. Absolutely. Uh, social media at Mike underscore Kala. You can hit me there on Twitter and on Instagram. And let me just run through the whole list of things at ESPN 630 that we got going on here. Uh, I fill in for Tony Kornheiser on Tuesday and Thursday. So that is 11 a.m. to noon. You can catch me on ESPN 630 and the ESPN 630 app. I'm, of course, on with Bram Weinstein 3 to 5. He is the voice of the commander. So always plug in with us. Uh, whenever Commander's News breaks, he tends to know things before just about everyone else. And then my new show uh, five to six o'clock every day is called the line change, a little hockey pun, gambling pun there. Just a sprint of what all the news is for the day. Plus, I give you some gambling picks heading into every single night. So you can pretty much catch me at all hours at this point. Well, I can't thank you enough, Mike. Go and enjoy this Easter Sunday sort. Sure and enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Always appreciate it. All right, brother. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. Mike Callow, brother of the podcast. And speaking of brother, how are you doing, man? How was Savannah, Georgia? It was beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah, it was beautiful. We were, our hotel was our was it, yeah we stayed in a hotel. It was the hotel was literally right across that body of water, like that was right out front of the convention center. Yep. Yeah, our hotel was like right literally right on the other side of that. You could look out the uh, look out of our little balcony thing. You could see like uh, the convention center. Oh, okay. Open carry state, so not like the guns, but like liquor. Yep. You can walk around with your drinks everywhere. Just like gives off like a lot of like New Orleans type vibes, like real cool. And then we went to Hilton Head. Up in uh, South Carolina, beautiful beach, beautiful little town, nice, great looking golf courses, nice golf courses. Did you definitely play? chill? So, huh? Did you play? No, nah, I wanted to, but because even Courtney was like, I don't care. Like, I'll drive the golf court where you just like fucking just get smashed, just get smashed and hit balls. And I was just like, that does sound fun, but I was just like, I don't want to go to this nice ass like uh, golf club, like sea pines like the rtc heritage is about to be down there in like two weeks like i didn't want to it's like i'm saying like real people go there and play i didn't want to take my sorry ass on the course and be hacking it up and, sh- and i was just like man nah, stop i should have but now nah, i think it was also like you got to be a member of the club to play so i was like yeah of course it's usually how it goes especially with those brother but i'm yeah. glad you had fun and the reason why you talked about the convention center uh that's where i was down working about a month or so ago i was down in Uncle and I stayed in Savannah, and we worked on the new convention center down there. And it is gigantic, dude. You could, they're going to be bringing in airplanes into that convention center. The size of it is gigantic. Now, let's answer some fan questions before we are joined by our next guest. Oh, but before we do questions, because I want to save the questions for our next guest here. But your thought process so far with the quarterbacks, you haven't been with us for the past couple episodes. The pro days have happened of Drake, May, and Jaden Daniels. I want to give you a little bit of speak your mind. How are you feeling about that quarterback pick and where are you right now? Yeah. So I I think last time I answered this, I said that I was going back and forth on it. Just one day I wake up and I want Jaden. The next day I wake up, I'm all in on Drake May. And I think uh, last time if I gave like a percentage, it was like 51% on Jaden, 49% Drake May. And I haven't really wavered. Like, I guess if I had to put a number on it, I'd say I'm, like 60% in and on, I think that, well, I say this, I, I want them to draft Jaden Daniels. What I think they'll do is draft Drake May. But if I had to put a percentage on as far as like Jaden Daniels versus Drake May, I guess I'm 60% Jaden Daniels, 40% Jaden uh, Drake May. I just think that, and everyone's, a lot of people have like said this and repeated this. I just think that Jaden Daniels gives you that instant kind of hit the ground running type of yes. uh, feel for the offense as far as like, okay, we can obviously use the whole playbook, but we can also get that running game involved that Cliff Kingsbury loves so much that he used with Kyler Murray. And like I said, he, that combo just gives you a little bit more quicker success in the NFL nowadays as opposed to a guy that – not saying Drake May is not a guy that can run, but he's obviously not Jaden Daniels. He's more of the pocket guy, and he'll get out of the pocket and then create. But – 
I just think that uh, – and then obviously people have said that Drake May's footwork is the type of thing that might take a little time to develop, kind of like maybe like that Josh Allen type of vibe where you'll see the flashes. It's because he makes year stupid one. plays, man. It's because he yeah, makes and, stupid and plays. That's the same thing Josh Allen does. He still does that, honestly. Josh Allen still does that. But it's just like you'll see the flashes year one or whenever he starts playing. Year two, you'll be like, okay, we got something. Then year three, hopefully, is when he takes off like a rocket. Hopefully year two if we draft him here. But – yeah, long story short, I just think that – not that I'm worried about the winning and, like, success next year. And, like, obviously I want them to win more than four games. You got to at least get to, like, six, seven wins next year. But, like I said, I just think that Jaden Daniels gives off that that kind of, like, that splash, explosion, excitement, that RG3 type of vibe where any he can take it to the house, he can throw a bomb to the house, he can run it to the house on any given play from any point on the field. And I just think that – Defenses in the NFL nowadays, defensive coordinators are – it stresses them out a lot more dealing with a guy like Jaden Daniels, especially early on, who where he's going to use his legs a little bit more just because, as opposed to a guy like Drake May. So, yeah, long story short, I'm still on Jaden Daniels. I hope they draft him, but my gut says that I think they might go Drake May too. Uh, I agree with you. I honestly don't know what their decision is. I, I think that the other quarterbacks are the big cog in this because Michael Penix can – throw some times dude the throws yeah. that i've seen him make are absolutely incredible you know i was watching a film on Kyrie jackson the other day and seeing the balls that michael Penix is putting out there in front of these guys these guys are not playing bad routes like they're playing good corner routes and michael Penix is diming it same thing with Jaden daniels he's like a sniper dude and if you looked at it like a bar graph for me like with Jaden daniels is like with the running ability, it's high, right? And so is the throwing ability because that software he used at LSU, that's the difference maker for me because he obviously benefited from it for going 40, 40 touchdowns of four interceptions, right? So not right. only do you have that running ability, but the glaring concern is that weight, is the running ability, and is that injury going to be a concern moving forward? And that's where it comes in with Drake May. Drake May in the bar graph, high as a thrower, Probably at the medium tier as a runner because he's not doing it as much. But, like, you had that long-term aspect, high, right? But not the short, in absolutely right now kind of thing. And I think you're right in the sense that our defense is going to really be concerned about Drake May's legs to the point where there's, like, a concern. But that's what Jaden Daniels offers you. And I think that the difference in all of this is going to be how usage and who really – long-term projects you more and I think Drake May does not project to that Josh Allen level because he's never shown you on the ground that Josh Allen-esque type stuff you know what I mean if that yeah, makes yeah sense. of course of course now yeah. let's we are now joined by our, our next guest here and our boy friend of the pod uh, also your seat neighbor uh from the UK host seat of the neighbor. one point safety show uh, our boy Mr. Scott Hartley from the UK oh how you doing boy brother? Yeah, hi, Kyle. Hi, Hall. Yeah, all good at my end. Thank you. Happy Easter to you both. I hope you're both doing very well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man, We're doing great, man. You. It's Easter Sunday. I'm, I know it's like midnight for you over there. Uh, but we got some fan questions, Scott, that we want to finish off this episode for that I know you're well aware on how we usually do this thing. But this <laughs> question is from the Colonel, Scott. He says, it seems current conventional wisdom is we take Jaden Daniels with the number two pick, then we use our second and third round draft picks to move back up into the first to get a left tackle. Do you guys agree with this theory, or do you think there's going to be some crazy, insane offer from Minnesota or New York moving up to get a quarterback? Uh, yeah, if you come into me first with that, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think we do need to trade back into the end of the first round. I think getting that left tackle of the future is the way to go. Um, I do think that there's going to be a run on tackles as well. So there's probably six, seven, eight tackles out there who could do a job at left tackle. And I think having that fifth year option, Colonel, makes a difference. You know, I think having that um, on the table and being able to say, right, for the next five years, your rookie quarterback and your rookie left tackle can grow together and they can learn from each other. I think that's the way to go with that one. Um, on, as as per an offer, I mean, unless it's the absolute farm, sell the farm completely, kind of the RG3 trade or Ricky Williams trade, that mm. sort of thing, I, I can't see it happening, to be honest. I think we're going to stand pat at two, take the QB from there and hopefully trade back into the first with a, pack, a package of picks. Yeah, Bleacher Report right now, Colonel, is saying that the commanders have not been wowed by any trade offers or anything, but I think that is funny in itself. Like, 
Washington's going to tell you what they're being offered in <laughs> trades right now. Right. Right? And they're, I'm sure they're telling Bleacher Report about it. Um, but in my opinion, even trading up for that left tackle is a concern for me because there are other avenues and other needs on this football mm-hmm. team. But obviously you need to have a left tackle or right tackle, depending on if your quarterback is right-handed or left-handed. And obviously it would sound great with New York. Uh, or Minnesota, but New York, I wouldn't want to trade with them. I don't want to give them an asset for them to possibly beat us with, right? So they can kick rocks uh, as far as I'm concerned. With Minnesota, I've said this before, it's fantastic that they have 10-23, and 23, but until that they put Justin Jefferson on that trade offer, I don't give a lick. You know, come back to me when you're serious about this because that's what's going to cost you. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you want your quarterback, it, you're going to have to sacrifice some. And Jordan Addison did, Addison did pretty well for you guys last season, and that's probably a good starting point for y'all. So that's all I'm saying. So put on JJ on that, and we'll maybe talk about it. So for me, the best avenue that I could go down is trading back into the first for a left tackle like a Troy Fontenew if he is there mm-hmm. because that is not as expensive. It's like only like a third rounder or a second rounder, possibly if you really <clears> wanted <throat> to do it. It doesn't cost all that much. So I'd rather go down that route, of course. Yeah, um, I'm just going to pretty much piggyback off what you guys said. I agree with both what both you guys said, just kind of working backwards on the question. Like, I do think that right now they are probably getting offers, but they're probably just like, like they're like you said, they're not going to tell. Even if there was a really, really, really nice offer on the table, if it got leaked out, it wouldn't be coming from Washington's side. It'd be coming from the team that's offering them, like, hey, this is what we got on the table. Everyone, like, put the pressure on Washington. Why aren't you taking this? Look at this. So I do think come draft, for like, what is the draft? April 25th. I think the 23rd, 24th, even while the number one pick is on the clock, I do think that there'll be – the phone will be ringing off the hook from teams like Las Vegas, Minnesota, uh, Denver, mm-hmm. probably the Giants. But – like you said, I'm going to X off the Giants. I'm not giving them their potential future franchise quarterback that they want to move, grow, move up to get that we got to face twice a year for the next 10, 15 years going forward. That's already off the table, no matter what you're trying to give us. No. And as far as like the other teams like Minnesota, like you said, if you're not giving us Justin Jefferson, unless you're going to give us majority of like your entire like picks this year and next year and you want to keep Justin Jefferson, all right, cool. Let's talk about it. But even then, it's like you got to compare, like, how much do we like quarterback A or B or C, like Jaden Daniels or Drake May, compared to a guy like Michael Penix or uh, Bo Nix, because I think J.J. McCarthy will be gone by the time you get to 10 also. Yeah. So there's a lot of avenues you can go down, but like you guys said, I think the best and the, the best avenue to stay, to go down and stay on is stay at number two, pick your quarterback of the future, and do whatever it takes to develop him so he's here for the next 10 to 15 years. Agree. Now, Scott, next question from the Colonel. Are we snake bitten with the offensive linemen that we draft? And please don't use the term position flex, or I'll put an ice pick in my eardrums. No, that's not a cry <laughs> for help. Only that we suck at drafting offensive linemen. Case in point, Sadiq Charles, Daniels, and Stromberg. I will say Cosme is probably the one. Well, I'm repping Cosme tonight. There so, go, um, yeah, he's... He's uh, he he for me has been an absolute find. I mean, but we had to move him to guard to make him that almost Pro Bowl talent. And I wouldn't want to see Cosby move back out to right tackle, which I know some fans have mentioned. I think you're kind of right there, Colonel. I think it's maybe just what has come out of the draft um, and what they believed has been a good a good find on on the previous regime's board. Um, funny enough, like Stromberg, you could take for example, you could take. Um, Braden Daniels as well, as we've talked about there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they've not turned out very well at all drafting-wise, but I think we've got better in the offensive line over the free agency period. So with Al Gretti, with Dieter as well as a you know backup centre, and with um, Biadish as well, I think we're doing well. we just got to find that left tackle, which is a difficult thing to do. And I'm quite good with Big Luke. You know what I mean? I think he's a good, a good re-signing for me. Yeah, addition by subtraction, uh, so to speak, in my personal opinion. No, we're not snake bitten. Uh, we were just horseshit at being able to um, <laughs> evaluate and be able to select. Yes. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Everybody yeah. and their mother, all these draft gurus, were going to tell you back in that draft that Sadiq Charles was a left tackle, and he was a steal to be able to get in the second or third round. I remember all those mock drafts. Um, no, I said it from the get-go, he's a guard. 
uh, with Daniels. As soon as I saw the film, I said, what the heck is this about? You could have gotten Dewan Jones in that sense. He mm-hmm. would be starting for you and possibly be getting Pro Bowl votes. Um, but, you know, the, you know, they don't listen to me. I just come here to tell you guys what my opinion is and how I see things. I'm not the end all be all. I don't know everything or see everything, but I will tell you, I don't know what the hell they're, they they saw. Uh, it's just because it, what we were concerned with when Ron Rivera came here was the dismantling of the offensive line, and we got to see that over a four-year period. I mean, hand in hand, every single year. And go down every single pick, except for Cosme, of course. But the fact of the matter was, even they tried to push him at left tackle, and they had to be pushed into a guard, which is just funny because coming out, you should have known that he was better set for a guard. I could have told you that. A lot of people mm-hmm. could have told you that. But, you know, but this is a point where he can still move to tackle. We don't know how they feel about it because obviously everyone's going to tell you that on the team website, he's listed at tackle, right? And look, mm-hmm. we don't know how they feel about it or what they're going to do. It's not what I would do, but that's why I'm sitting here and I don't have a job with them. Now, the next question is, Hall, this one's from the Colonel real quick. Are we going to draft a legitimate red zone threat at tight end or a wide receiver that's taller than 6'1"? This is reportedly a deep wide receiver slash tight end class. So will we target a big man? Um, I would assume that they're definitely going to target a tight end at one point in the draft. I do not know. Um, I would hope that they're not like thinking that Zach Ertz is going to be the answer going into the season just with his injury history and whatnot. But again, if you look at all the positions that were like holes, obviously there's still more holes, but a lot of the positions that were holes for this team were filled with day one starters or guys that have been that can start and there are veterans in this league that are going to be good mentors for young guys if we so happen to draft that position. So I do think they're going to attack tight end. Um, maybe in the top 40, maybe they'll do it with the next pick after 40. But uh, I do think the next, the top three to four rounds, they should probably draft the tight end. But as far as uh, a receiver goes, it's really, da- really deep draft for receivers. You're right. I do think that we need like a taller kind of big body guy. But again, that tight end can definitely help with that. And as far as the red zone goes, I'm not really a, like uh, – for me, the red zone thing, you don't really got to be like that tall, big body, like go up and get it type of guy. You just got to be, be able to go up and get it. For me, you can be five foot nine, like a Steve Smith type guy, but what does Steve Smith do? He was going to go up and get that ball, fight for it, mm. come down with it most of the time. Look at a guy like Terry McLaurin, six one, six foot six one, whatever he might be, one of the best go up and get it, 50-50 ball, 50-50 guys in the league right now. So – as far as like the height goes and the size, like, yeah, we do need that. And I would like that. Add that at tight end. That'd be good for me. And the red zone threat, as long as you're a guy that's going to be that got that dog in him and that's going to fight for the ball and just go up and get it and be like, hey, just to tell the quarterback, throw it up and I'll get it for you. That's all I need. You don't got to be big body. You can be a guy my size. As long as you got that dog in you and, and you um, can play the position, I'm good with whatever uh, height you are. So. I do agree with you, though. We do need a big, like a red zone threat, definitely for sure. Um, I, I don't agree with that with tight end. Um, when you look at the kind of history with the NFL and these tight ends that truly become really good names and are dependable tight ends, like George Kittle, uh, Mark Andrews, that's the sort of prospect that we should be looking to add here in a long term uh, format. Um, we already have somebody on the roster who can't block well, so we erased Jared Wiley off this list. Yeah, he's six seven. It's fantastic to have, but you have to be able to plug somebody in in a very crucial situation to get another man off the line of scrimmage. Can you trust that guy at your drafting? And if it's a high value guy, you better make sure he could do it right away because he's going to see some time. In my personal opinion, I think we need to be going down the route of adding a stable, long term, legit tight end, somebody that's not going to blow the screen. When George Kittle coming out of college was he somebody who was highly sought after? Has caught one handed balls? Was doing incredible catches? No. He just did his job, and that's the tight, sort of tight ends that we need to be looking at. I know Jatavion Sanders it sounds amazing. I'm sure it is, but what did we hear from Darnell Washington this year, season? And that's the sort of kind of production level I would imagine you're going to be getting from Jatavion, and so I would be eyeing away from that. With wide receiver, it does intrigue me a heck of a whole lot. I think there is something to be said there, and there's a lot of options here. you got like Brendan Rice and others, but we have a question of wide receivers later on. But, yes, I do expect the wide receiver to be added at some point in this draft. And Malachi Corley, the children of the corn leader, that's somebody to keep an eye on. The next question, this one's submitted on the Discord, Scott, and this is from your boy Andy. Would you be happy with J.J. McCarthy at two? Oh, I knew he was going to go there. I knew he was going to go there. Um, honestly, I, I've said this before. I think we have to trust the process and be patient. 
uh, with who they decide they want to take. If that's their quarterback, go and get your quarterback. Um, I trust Adam Peters wholeheartedly in this. I think the adults are in the room now. We we mentioned it a little bit early on Colonel's question before that you're not hearing anything coming out to tell you one way or the other who they're taking. Um, would I be slightly disappointed? Yeah, probably. I, I I'm you know I'm I, I'll be honest. I'm sixty forty. Jaden Daniels. Uh, but on on um, Drake May, but does it mean I like them both? Absolutely. I'm going to have a Twitter meltdown. No, I'm not. So you just got to trust them and say that yes, this is going to happen. Either way, we're going to get a top-rated quarterback. I think there's probably a good career for four, if not five, of these out of this this set of quarterbacks that are coming out. I think Penix is going to do very well. I'm not so sure on Bo Nix, but you know the rest of them. Yeah, I think they're all going to have very good careers. So. I think we just got to trust it. And yes, uh, if JJ is the pull, is who they pull the trigger on it to, then yeah, it'll be slightly disappointed, but it, it, it doesn't matter. I've got to trust that they're picking their guy. Yeah. Good thing that you went in front of me, Scott, and your wisdom, um, because no, I wouldn't be happy, but you're absolutely right. We would have to just trust their decision there at two. Um, I'm not the end. I'll be all in the, the eyes in the sky, so to speak. Um, I, I didn't like what I saw, but I understand why his name is out there. Um, it's just for me personally, I would be disappointed, but I would understand and trust that this is the direction that we are going and moving forward in. And I, I'm, I would uh, support it, obviously, because it's not the, just, this isn't this isn't the regime to kind of poo poo these kind of moves. If DS mm-hmm. is still here, I would obviously have a, probably be more pissed off than that, because like, it'd be it would bring back memories of the E man Christian Gonzalez thing. No disrespect to E man, I'm just saying I was very disappointed because I was on that. Christian Gonzalez so train from the get-go. So, so was I. That you was know that too. Really it's, embarrassing. Um, it's one of them, isn't it? I mean, we're not, we're not hearing anything coming out of the out of Ashburn or out of the, the team, which is great to hear. I mean, if, if DS was still here, no doubt about it, we'd be locked in and everybody would know who that pick is already. Um, but we'll we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see what happens. But JJ, it's interesting because this reminds me so much of the Trey Lance move when the with the 49ers. One week it was they're definitely going for Trey Lance. Then the next week it was, oh, it's Mac Jones. It's Mac Jones for about a month. Mm. Then it went back to Trey Lance and it's gone back and forward, back and forward. And every week on social media, it's a different person who we're going to pick it to. So don't believe any smoke. It's lion season after all. We'll see when we get to the draft, basically. You're absolutely right, dude. And uh, Hall, you being a Michigan fan, I'm sure this is a touchy subject for you. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm a I like JJ McCarthy. I definitely see why, like you said, the NFL people like him. He definitely has the tools. His highlight reel throws make you literally drop your jaw. Like, how did he fit that in that window type throws? But for me, and obviously he was a Harbaugh, so he's already like kind of been under that pro system umbrella. Um, obviously the intangibles, like obviously like NFL uh, GMs love the intangibles, like all the winning and leadership and whatnot, but for just for me personally, like, like you said, would I be mad if they got him at two? Like, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, I would say I'd be mad. I would just be like, slightly disappointed because I do think that if you do like JJ McCarthy, you can trade back a couple spots and still get him in the top five, six, seven picks, whatever it might be. But again, like you guys said, I'm just gonna trust that they this regime knows how to scout talent. They know what they're doing. They have they actually have a plan that they've put together and they're going to move forward with that plan as opposed to kind of just pivoting from plan to plan, to plan, to plan, jumping around, not really having a solid plan. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, just like with the whole Jaden Daniels versus Drake may debate, I want them to draft Jaden Daniels. If they draft Drake may, am I going to go on Twitter and go on a 50 tweet rant about it and be mad every day? Probably. Right. Exactly. Am I going to, pray for his downfall like a lot of fans do because they don't draft their guy and they they want to be right so they'll root for them being right on twitter as opposed to the player hopefully developing and uh, becoming a good player so no i'm not gonna do any of those things i'm gonna support the player hope that he uh pans out hope they have a plan to develop him and hope that he does develop but jj mccarthy at two is for me would be a no but like you guys said i don't work for the team adam peters is clearly way smarter than me and if he sees something in JJ McCarthy at pick number two, that he'll be here and he's the guy. Then all you got to, all you can do is trust that he knows what he's doing. They know what they're doing, and he'll be the guy. This is absolutely incredible. This is the second time that I've seen a Michigan fan 
after winning the national championship with this quarterback, saying no to their college quarterback being selected by them at the number two overall. It's actually kind of amazing, but I agree with you, and you're being honest, and I absolutely love that about you. Look, you're not biased in this sort of sense, and I love it. I'm, and look, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not even – like, I could say the same things about – I'm a Terps fan. I could say the same things about one of their players, but, it, you know, I try to look at it without, like, a bias, like – oh, he played for my team and I like this team, so he's going to be good. And I used to do that a long time ago, and I realized that'll get you uh, looking kind of dumb when in the, in, the, in, the, in the end results. So I try to look at it with a, a non-biased blue and maize or burgundy and gold eyes. I just try to look at it like it is, tell it like it is, and hope for the best. But I will say this, though. With all the stuff leaking about, about uh, Ben Johnson back then and da-da-da-da-da, ended up being not being Ben Johnson. This this regime has been so tight lipped that any information that leaks yeah. out about one week they're like, oh, they're they're leaning toward Jaden Daniels. And then next week it's oh, they really like JJ McCarthy at two. And that makes me think that it might not be either of those guys. That's why I said my gut is telling me it's going to be Drake May because yeah. you have not heard one word leaked about Drake May and how the commanders like him and they're leaning towards it him. It's really it's wrong. been a lot of the other guys. Yeah, it was first off. It was it was it was early in the process. Yeah, yeah, I early on, but I'm just saying, like, yeah. as the process gets closer and closer, you're hearing yeah. a lot of smoke about all the other guys that they so called like. You ain't heard nothing about. Oh, they love Drake May, so that's all I'll just say about I'll that. Tell, I'll tell after we stop recording. I'll tell you something that was told to me by a, a very good friend of ours that we like a lot, um, and so maybe that'll help change your mind just a little bit. But now the next question we have, this one was this one was submitted by Deluxe, and I'm going to answer this one. He said, your pod was the first place I heard about Xavier Leggett. Now I'm seeing and hearing his name mentioned a lot. Is his draft stock rising? And what round do you think he goes in now? I know his draft stock isn't necessarily rising. This is a very talent-heavy draft for wide receivers. Those guys have always dominated the top 15, top 16. Xavier Legit has been floating around that top of the second round ever since early on in the draft process when I saw him. Big guy, big target. He shows the ability to match the ball at its highest catch point. Big wide receiver that makes plays, has good hands in these contested situations, and he he needs to work on his footwork and all that. But at this moment, it seems like because of the talent at wide receiver that Xavier Legit could possibly fall to the middle to late round, end of the second, early third round. And that's not a bad thing. There's a plenty of talent in this draft that you can go to, and that's probably the reason for it because, like we've talked about, there could be like eight tackles taken in the first round, right? And that's yeah. going <clears> to <throat> push a lot of guys down that you weren't expecting. Like uh, like Cooper DeYoon, uh from Iowa, I expect that guy to fall to the middle of the second, early third. I don't think he's that good, but I could be wrong. Now the next question, this one was submitted by Tim Towner. Scott. Time is getting shorter, and the earth is getting big in the window. What are we going to do at left tackle? We have Wiley, Lucas, Scott, and King Blue on the roster. And to be honest, all these guys are best depth players. Are we honestly looking at drafting an offensive tackle at 36 or 40 and asking them to start as a rookie? Uh, no, I don't think we're – Tim, great question. Um, I don't think we're looking at drafting a uh, rookie left tackle at 30 or 40. I think we're trading back into the first round to try and get a a more first round graded tackle. I think Mims somewhere like that, someone of that of that ilk might be out there. I don't know if Amaris Mims is more of a right tackle. I'm not sure. Um, the chat, who's the guy from Arizona? Um, can't remember his name Jordan either as Morgan. a tackle. Yeah, maybe someone like Jordan Morgan. The end of the first. I think it's probably right that we trade right back into the the end of the first because. As I said before, you get that fifth-year option. So having that fifth-year option means that you've got more. If he becomes a solid, dependable starter, you've got that extra year there to to play with to try and sort out numbers further down the line. But yeah, I mean, there's not a lot on the on the free agency market that's out there. Would it be comfortable with Luke Cook, Cornelius Lucas, and Akinbulu and Trent Scott, them sort of players who are out there? Probably we're going to have to get on with it, but. Lucas hasn't let us down when he's come in the starting mm. lineup. That's one thing we can say. He's always been dependable. So um, would, would I go with him as a, as a full-time starter? Probably not, but he's a very good um, swing tackle that we've got back. Uh, I think that we are looking at offensive tackle. You know, LJ on Twitter um, kind of went after me when I posted about David Bakhtiari being released from mm -hmm. the Packers and me saying, you know, looking at it, 
And she said, you know, he's been very, very injured. But I, I wanted to be candid and honest and say, well, if you keep poo-pooing these left tackle guys away who are starters in the league at some point, you're going to be left like Michael Scott at the office at the job fair where he poo-poos the kid away, <laughs> then nobody wants to jo- join them, and now he's hustling, trying to find that kid to try to now recruit him onto his team. And in my thought process here is I feel like Washington is in a position where they don't have to go down that route if they wanted to. There's players out there like David Bakhtiari who are out there, Charles Leno, who are still out there that you could re-sign and bring in here as starters who've done it before at a high level if they're co- sort of medical things check out. And so I don't think it's in an, a situation where you have to do it, regardless of what tackle is there. I think that Wash- Washington traded Hal and got the extra third rounders in order if they are put in a position where a left tackle who they believe can start is there in that range that they can go up and attack it in, in my personal opinion, but there are avenues and ways that they can go down. So in my personal opinion, I don't think they're done at left tackle, but I also don't think that their starting left tackle is either a rookie or is jobless right now. I think they could also trade draft picks for a starting left tackle on a team right now i think there's a big possibility as well what do you think all yeah i have two different thoughts on this i do think that so one of my one of my thought processes behind this is they stay pat they don't have to trade up into the first round do i like the fifth year option of course i do would i like to have that for my left the tackle option forward? for me hall sorry to cut you off like doesn't matter at all i'm more so of making sure that guy doesn't leave because getting yeah, yeah. a startable left tackle as a rookie is very, very hard, especially in that second round. Oh, 100%. I just like the fifth-year option because it just delays, like, the big contract that you're going to inevitably have to pay him if he's that good. It just delays it that one extra more year, you know what I'm saying? So that gives you an extra year to, like, hey, I can uh, maybe play around with the salary cap and sign this player or go all in or whatever the whatever it may be. But I do think that they don't have to trade up back into the first round to get a guy because – If you think about how the draft board, maybe this is just their process, I'm thinking. If they think about how the draft board is going to break, people are talking about there could be seven to eight, maybe nine tackles drafted in the first round. That may be true, but you also got to think that with the quarterbacks being pushed up the board and be people, uh, teams being so quarterback needy, a guy like Michael Penix, a guy like Bo Nix might get overdrafted. So that's going to push those left tackles down the board. Smart maybe, man, boy. Man. Maybe a guy that you've been targeting, and you're like, you know what? We don't have to give up draft picks and trade back in. He'll still be there at 36. Or we go from 36 to the top of the second round, a little bit less draft capital, and you still get your guy. So like 31, I do 32. think there's – Exactly, exactly. So there's, there's different ways you can work around it. Like you said, there's a lot of veterans still out there that are – if their medicals check out, that are still viable options. And you can still draft a guy in the second round to be the guy that's waiting in the wings. And maybe you go the uh, – um, what's the dude that just signed with the Jets from the Cowboys? Um, uh, Tyron Smith? Uh, Smith. Tyron, Tyron Smith. Smith. You go the Tyron Smith route where – Getting back shots from Aaron Rodgers in locker room. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> that was funny. Dude, He's like, I can't so believe I got to come on Twitter and, like, deny these allegations that I was getting back shots <laughs> in the Cowboys locker room. But now um, – <laughs> I think they can go the route as far as practice goes where you get that veteran, like the practice reps here and there, but you also put the rookie in during the week to get those reps and get that, you know what I'm saying, get a little bit of uh, not really action, but that game flow type of practice. And uh, he gets a lot of rep, gets a lot of practice reps while your veteran sits, gets rested up, and maybe plays a little bit more couple games, a little bit more healthy throughout the rest of the season. So, uh, like I said, there's multiple options they can go about this, hopefully – I wouldn't be mad if they traded back into the first round because that means they spotted a guy, they saw him, they want him, and they think that he can be a day one starter and he'll be a piece going forward. So I like that option as well. That's the beauty about this draft right here. We got so many different routes and so many different rounds that we are set up for success anywhere we go. Yeah, and let's finish this episode off with our last question in the Discord by our our little co-host here and Scott Hartley. He asked, <laughs> what is your go-to th- go thing to do during the Easter holidays? Family time or something else? So, Scott, I know this is really weird, but you want to answer your own question? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can do. For me, yeah, it's all about family time. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my children are getting older. So, Easter eggs, chocolate eggs, yeah, they'll have a few. But we'll go out for a meal generally somewhere, um, spend a bit of time walking um, kind of around the hills. 
Um, I live in the Lake District, so there's lots of my mountains in the UK, so and lots of little lakes. So we've been to two today. Um, so we'll go out and we'll have a little walk around there, and then that's pretty much it. It's it's a few days off. It's a good holiday. Um, obviously celebrating. Do you know what I mean? What what we're doing. So that is it for me. Um, what about you guys, really? Uh, for me, well, obviously, the first thing we do, we go to church um, on yeah. Sundays, but we spend time with family. Uh, my family in particular, uh, when I was young, we would do a lot of big things for Easter. Uh, we would meet up with my uh, stepmom's family. Up, and one year we did Lancaster, Pennsylvania is where we met up for some reason. And I'll never forget, I, that was the first time I saw like an Amish buggy pull up to a bank <laughs> drive through using the ATM card. I was like, wait, aren't you not wow. supposed to be doing that? But, you know, that was that was a really cool sight. Um, but for the majority, it's family time. Unfortunately, today I wasn't able to go see my family today and celebrate with them. But uh, my wife and I, we were able to go celebrate with her family, do Easter egg hunts for the kids. Uh, you should have seen what the kids got. My son's eating so much candy and cake today. It's insane. But, yes, that's what we do is just family time, Easter egg hunts, and church, brother. Yeah, um, just go out to – usually we'll go out to eat. Uh, Courtney's parents will – Either have a little like lunch, early like lunch, uh, whatever you want to call it, at uh, their house or you you can try to not act white about it. It's called brunch, okay? No, no, no it's not because there's no like <laughs> breakfast food. I was gonna say early dinner, but I'm like it's not really dinner either. I don't know. It's just <laughs> just like a ham stuff like that. Traditional Easter food like ham. I know what you mean. Stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, like stuffing today. Yeah, <laughs> today we uh, it's dressing that stuff. Today we uh. What did we do? Oh, we went out to eat, got lunch at a like a restaurant, and then we went back to their house. The girls like did like a little Easter egg hunt. Like her parents like hit him in the house, so they found him in the house, and then we took him outside, and I like hit him outside in the front of the backyard. And they went out, looked for him, found him, whatever, blah blah blah. And then uh, yeah, I just I mean I left. They're still over there, I think maybe, but I left and came back to do this. But nothing really like, serious, you know. Just spend time with family, do like the little Easter egg hunt thing, like most. Uh, people with like kids and whatnot do so you know traditional stuff i'm with it and i wanted to say real quick uh welcome back home to our boy yem sensei in the discord lived in yeah, ja uh, japan for a number of years helped teach yeah. him now he's back home uh here in the u.s and it was a big move for him not he didn't necessarily want to come but you know what <laughs> glad to have him back i know it's hard for him at the moment with his current situation so prayers to yem and the situation that he is going through I'm um, just putting it out there. A movie my wife, uh, my wife and I watched for Easter holiday um, was The Case for Christ. Um, is about a man and his wife who his wife converts to religion and Christianity, and her husband who works for the Chicago Tribune is based on a true story. Um, goes out of his way to try to fact check the Christian religion and goes through every single piece of trying to figure out the deficiencies in it. It's a really really good movie. Uh, so it's not all like expecting one sided, but you'll kind of see both sides of everything, and you'll see ultimately what the uh, answer is at it all. So I would really <clears throat> advise you guys to go out and watch it. It's a really, really good film. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. You made it this far. You're a freaking champion. I appreciate you guys. Scott, as always, man, brother of this podcast, fellow American, it feels like. <laughs> You've been a, Not yet. <laughs> been a very good friend of ours. You know, we cannot wait to see you again, brother. It's been too long. But before we get out of here, I'd like to plug your social media handle in your show. Just in case anyone watching hasn't followed you yet, brother, and would like to. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Hall. It's always a pleasure being on with you guys. We will see you in September. We're, we'll be there game one. You know how it goes. Um, yeah, we're um, on the One Point Safety Show. We go on every Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern um, or 8 p.m. UK time. So, uh, yeah, come across. It's live on YouTube. You can find us on there, and it's downloadable on all of the um, social medias. My chat handle is in the bottom here as well. So I got you. And uh, make sure this time when we buy the tickets, that we, <laughs> we buy our tickets included, we'll pay you guys. Yeah. So that way we're actually sitting next to Don't each worry, other man. when we buy these. Yeah. And then also, if you guys are going to an away game, uh, let me know. I, I, I do, mm -hmm. would like to do it with you boys as well. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you again on Thursday. Appreciate you if you made it this far. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. And we'll see and you I'm guys a better looking Reed. There, there you go. You go. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't disprove it, brother. All right, everybody. Watch the football. <laughs> Woo! What's up, everyone? This is Kyle from the Burgundy Zone. We are releasing our own merch to support the show. If you want to rock the Burgundy Zone logo or you want to see Reed's face on your shirt, we got it. We're starting with t-shirts, hoodies, and zip up. So if you're a fan of the show, make sure you snag one before they are gone. Check out the link in our bio on Instagram, or you can find the link in the description of the video. Thanks again for all your support. Until next time.